Morning, everyone, and welcome at this event hosted by the European Policy Center in collaboration with the European Commission and focusing on the 2022 edition of Health at a Glance, the Europe edition. My name is Elizabeth Kuiper. I'm Associate Director at the European Policy Center and Head of the Social Europe and Wellbeing Program. The Health at a Glance report series, which is a collaboration between the OECD and DG Santé, assesses the EU's progress toward effective, accessible, and resilient health systems. The 2022 edition of the Health at a Glance, Europe edition, examines the key challenges European countries must address to develop stronger, more resilient healthcare systems following the acute phase of the COVID-19 pandemic. Because let's not forget, technically we're still in the context, in the midst of a pandemic. And this includes a focus on the impact the pandemic had on young people's mental and physical health, as well as an assessment of the pandemic's disruption of a wide range of health services for non-COVID patients. It also addresses several critical behavioral and environmental risk factors that have significantly impacted people's health and mortality, emphasizing the importance of focusing more on the prevention of both communicable and non-communicable diseases. So I believe we have a lot of interesting content to offer. As always, the Health as a Glance report is uh, very rich in what they have to offer in terms of data. Um, so I'm really looking forward to your interactive um, contributions. We have a great uh, line of speakers uh, lined up. And I think you by now know um, how to come in. We really count on your uh, proactive contribution. Please raise your hand, um, speak um, via the chat. Um, chair, uh, feel free to uh, share with us uh, your recommendations or your suggestions via the chat. And I think by now you know how that works. Perhaps a little reminder before we actually go into um, the running order of the meeting. Um, the event is organized in the framework of SURF, a project co-funded by the European Union. So we kindly ask you to fill an evaluation survey on the link below. And the details, I believe, will be shared in the chat box. So with that, I really would like to start the event. And um, I start with Francesca Colombo of the OECD. And Francesca, it's great to have you with us. Um, we're looking forward to have your contribution because you will provide an overview of the key findings of the report. And that will be followed by two short panel discussions with stakeholders. So the floor is yours, please. Thank you for so much, uh, Elizabeth, for this uh, great uh, introduction. I will have some slides that I'll share. I will not be able to give justice to all the data indicators and information which is included in Health the Glance. So I will really focus on uh, some of uh, the main findings that pertain to the uh, specific chapters, uh, to uh, uh, chapters uh, which are related to young people and to disruptions uh, in healthcare services. But obviously, the Health at the Glance publication includes much, much uh, more than just those uh, chapters. I believe you should now see the, uh, the slides in, uh, in full screen. And let me start by acknowledging again that this is uh, um, the results of a fantastic, excellent collaboration that we have with DG Sante. I see that um, Maya is uh, with us today. It's a real pleasure for us to, to work together. And I think we cannot really achieve these results without the excellent collaborations. It's also the, the start of uh, these two-year cycles that maybe many of you are by now familiar with, but the state of health in the EU. Um, so it starts with the health of the glands and then it continues with uh, the country profiles as well. But enough of on process, but I think it's, uh, it's important again to reiterate uh, how this is uh, the results of uh, uh, significant efforts by uh, different teams and different organizations. Um, so I wanted to start, and this is actually a little bit more updated than what you find in Health at the Glance, but I was uh, trying to see, okay, where are we now with, uh, you know, um, a headline indicators in terms of death from COVID-19 and, uh, and excess uh, uh, death. I mean, it's, I don't need to tell any of you how much obviously the pandemic has been a disruptions and the reason why we have so much also discussions, which is very good discussion right now about how do we take the learning from the pandemic is that the numbers are really quite staggering. Um, so since the beginning of the pandemic in EU countries, like 1.2 million people that have died, but this is an underestimate uh, linked to the fact that there are other people that died because of indirect consequences of COVID-19. 
um, but also because of disruptions of, of, of care and so forth. And the uh, count of the number of COVID-19 deaths is not entirely accurate because just of uh, uh, registration, death registration practices that might difference across countries. So it's quite interesting to see what happened to the excess uh, deaths, which is really the indicators that look at mortality above what could be expected looking at the, at the past. Uh, uh, you know, five years of, uh, of mortality. And we see here, actually, that if we look at the most recent data, so it's uh, up to uh, November 2022, we see actually a widening between the uh, COVID-19 deaths and excess uh, deaths. So while perhaps, you know, taking into consideration obviously all the limitations with the, with the data, um, we see that so we continue to have that from COVID-19, but we see an excess uh, mortality, which is uh, somehow becoming bigger, mm -hmm. higher, and uh, widening from uh, uh, the COVID death per self. And that probably it's uh, one thing that we may have reflect upon, you know, what have been the wider, um, also indirect consequences of COVID-19 and how this is uh, uh, challenging our ability to provide good outcomes to populations. Um, this is actually reflected then even in the headline indicators like life expectancy. I'm not showing you in, in this graph, but in a number of countries, it has actually decreased. Uh, in the past uh, few uh, years. So again, you know, are we setting back against some of the previous achievements that we had seen prior to COVID-19? Now, I would like to go uh, a little bit more in depth in the results of uh, the analytical chapters of Health at the Glance. Um, the first one focus on the pandemic impacts on, the, on the young people. Now, we know that the pandemic clearly affected more directly uh, older people. That's the number of uh, uh, people who died were overwhelmingly uh, among the, the older people. But still, young people are the ones that felt uh, much more some of the consequences of COVID-19 in terms of disruptions that they had in uh, their social activities, in uh, the education, as well as in the health services. And given that those are, you know, the generations uh, that um, we want to build on for, uh, for uh, the future of health system and of society more broadly, it's quite important to take a look at what happens to them. And the numbers are really quite frightening uh, from uh, some respect, and I'll uh, show some slides particularly on the impacts uh, on mental health, there have been also impacts on uh, more physical health, um, but uh, this might be familiar for some of you. It looks at the rate of uh, uh, depressive uh, symptoms among young people, which we see for a number of countries with the exception. I mean, they, they increase in, in all the, the countries increase, but they more than doubled in a, a large number of, uh, of the countries shown in this, uh, in this graph. And in some cases, uh, it's even much, much more. We're talking about tripling, if not quadrupling of, uh, uh, of, uh, of the numbers. And this is true for young people. And here, when young people were looking really at the age group between 18 and 29, but uh, similarly, we find uh, uh, worsening mental health and well-being among younger population groups, so the, the children, the, the adolescents, uh, which have been very much uh, um, affected. And this, uh, you know, those rates of uh, increase in mental health conditions is more important than what we see for uh, all adult populations. So it's not the adult population were unaffected, but just that it's not in, uh, shown in, in this graph, but uh, uh, younger people have been disproportionately more negatively affected when it comes to their uh, mental health. Now, uh, there's been also a, a, a confluence, if you want, a, a compounding of uh, um, disadvantage um, as, as well, because those people who are more um, directly and negatively impacted uh, can be found among certain also um, population groups within the, the younger people. So those, for example, which uh, have uh, more insecurity in terms of financial security, that other they live in households with more financial insecurity or who uh, perceive uh, as living in a situation of more financial insecurity, they're even at a higher risk of uh, uh, mental health uh, uh, disruption in the system. So young people in in precarious situations uh, and circumstances at, are a heightened risk. But this is shown if we look just at the EU uh, average, uh, for example, we see a, a significant higher 
a share of younger people at risk of uh, uh, depression among those with financial difficulties relative to those with no reported financial difficulties. And that is uh, clear for all the countries uh, as well. So it's, uh, it's, it's a difference which is quite significant, like around nearly 70% among those with financial uh, difficulties relative to more around 50%, uh, slightly less than 50% of those with no reported financial um, difficulties. Last slides, which I wanted to, to show again on, uh, on the issues of uh, uh, mental health uh, for young people, we uh, see a, a significant reporting uh, by uh, this category of young people about unmet needs for mental health services. So again, the pandemic has led to disruptions in the, uh, the services, increase in waiting time in a number of countries for, uh, for services. And this has uh, clearly affected uh, uh, young people much more than what we see for uh, adults. And this graph shows uh, the half uh, of young people uh, reported unmet needs for mental care services in two point of time that are shown in this graph in spring 2021 and spring 2022. Now, there have been other um, also disruptions in the physical activities, particularly related to uh, ability also to have, uh, um, you know, a more active, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, physical activity and uh, the nutrition of uh, younger people that might have uh, consequences also for things like obesity and overweight. It's not shown in these graphs, but I think it's important to note that they're not just the mental health, but there are also some physical health impacts. So the, the second set of uh, uh, things which I wanted to talk to, which is the other analytical chapter in the Health at the Glance publication, relates to disruptions on non-COVID uh, care. So there have been all sorts of types of different uh, care which has been significantly disrupted with delays in, uh, in treatments and in access uh, to services. And uh, this is shown, for example, in, uh, in this slide, which um, shows uh, and uh, the unmet uh, healthcare needs for a variety of, uh, of, of different services um, in relation uh, to uh, you know, the ability to, to receive also healthcare provision. So if you look on the right, about half, of EU citizens reported issues in accessing uh, hospital and specialist care, but uh, you can see there are significant numbers in a number of other services, whether it's dental health, preventing uh, and screening uh, mental health services, of course, but also the GPs, you know, 20% of people, one in five, uh, that report and met needs for GP uh, consultations. So it's, uh, it's again, these are, you know, disruptions which, the consequences of which will be felt for a long time and it might um, affect uh, you know, outcomes uh, uh, indicators as uh, also shown in the, in the initial uh, slides. Just one uh, slide on, on cancer, because we know that uh, uh, you know, the beating cancer plan is a significant you know, priority for, uh, for European countries when the commissions. And this graph shows uh, uh, some of the drop in cancer screening specifically uh, for um, uh, mammography for cancer uh, diagnosis uh, uh, and treatment. So the percentage of female age 50 and uh, 69, which have been screened for breast uh, cancers. We see how all countries are uh, far away from the targets, which is set in the EU beating uh, cancer plans. But we also see that uh, uh, during uh, the time of the pandemic, so between um, 2019 and 2020, and few data that we have 2021, there's been a, a drop in the percentage of females which are screened by 6%. These drops have been higher, um, more significant, uh, wider in countries which started already from a, a low uh, threshold, a low uh, uh, percentage of, uh, of female being screened. So in a way, some of the widening perhaps of uh, the inequalities uh, um, might be uh, um, brought about by, by the pandemic. Now on the, on the good side, perhaps the good news is, uh, is the pandemic also triggered innovations, uh, one of which is on uh, the digital transformation health systems and the use of uh, uh, different uh, ways of uh, providing services such as teleconsultation and telehealth. So in virtual all countries, the, um, you know, there's been a drop in in-person um, 
uh, consultations, but an increase in, uh, in teleconsultation, which, uh, which is really something which is, uh, um, um, you know, both uh, perhaps to be expected, but also a positive uh, development, you know, you know, that is a way also to provide services, which is more people centered and closer uh, to the patients. So that's uh, um, all quite uh, positive. You'll see on, on the right, so the share of uh, teleconsultations has uh, you know, doubled between 2019 and 2020. This is not to say that there are no uh, issues uh, that needs to be considered. For example, whether there are some digital exclusions, there are certain category of uh, populations, including older, but also some of the poorer people, and even those living in uh, rural areas that for a variety of reasons, uh, of uh, reasons uh, actually do not benefit as much from teleconsultations. Um, just a, a summary of some of the key findings on disruptions of, uh, of services, some of, uh, of which are shown, uh, others I'll just uh, mention briefly, but you know, on the positive again, as I mentioned, the teleconsultations, but also the increase in the flu vaccination among older people, that's something which certainly has been positive. On the negative, the mental health issues also clearly for um, uh, adults, not just for uh, for young people, although they've been more felt for young people. Fewer cancer surgeries um, as well. Fewer elective surgery, a dramatic drop in elective surgery and, and increase in, in waiting time. Um, so it's quite a lot of challenges that you know are still leaving uh, with us. And I would like to, to mention also some of the issues that I'm moving on to the, you know, concluding also remarks that I have said that quite, quite clearly the um, pandemic showed the need for having health system which are better ready and prepared to withstand a shock, something which, uh, uh, you know, came up, which is unexpected, which are more resilient. That's the, you know, the buzzword that we are all talking uh, about. We made some estimates in OECD that uh, to achieve that, you actually need to have more investments in health system, which are not just across the board. They are in targeted areas where clearly there are uh, deficiencies that needs to be, to be addressed. One of which uh, is the health workforce. Um, others relate to things like prevention or even more investing in the digital uh, transformation of health system. But I will, you know, want to conclude therefore with a couple of, uh, uh, of reflections which are a little bit beyond what you find in the in the uh, charts of the health, uh, the graph, but maybe to, um, you know, kick off uh, the discussion. The first one has to do with the financial sustainability or the sustainability of, um, of health systems. Um, as I did mention, you know, having health systems which are more resilient to future shock, but also are better ready to, you know, um, bring us that people-centeredness uh, and uh, that health system which is uh, responsive to health needs of populations which are changing. Uh, think about the demographic change, aging of the population and so forth. Clearly, we have seen that we need to have more uh, targeted investments, but we live in a context of a uh, thermocrising uh, crisis or multi-crisis. Um, there are significant economic challenges and inflationary pressures, cost of living crisis and economic downturn in a number of countries. And this puts at risk the possibility, even from uh, Ministry of, uh, of Finance and Ministry of Health in countries to really inject more resources into health system. And so the question of how do we fund those resources and how do we square the circle becomes mm, very prominent here. There can be different uh, options that you can think, you know, we can think about uh, raising more taxes um, so that we can fund the additional resources needed for health, but uh, clearly the appetites from populations uh, is not necessarily high um, in, uh, you know, in, in all countries and across all uh, groups. We can uh, also decide to uh, allocate more resources to help relative to what is spent in other parts of government budgets. And here, this becomes a matter of competition for limited resources, particularly in the context in which there are other pressure on government budgets. Uh, we can reevaluate what is paid publicly and what is left to individuals to pay by themselves. So, looking again at the basket uh, of what is covered or we can really do more to reduce ineffective uh, spending. So, but I think there would be probably a need to have wider debates about how do we deal with that? We certainly need more uh, funding and more uh, investments in health systems, but the situation is not the most rosy given the multi-crisis um, circumstances. And the second one has to do really with uh, the workforce, which uh, we have seen have been 
Um, so widely affected by the pandemic with health workers, which are on the break of uh, breakdowns uh, themselves. Um, and so this graph just illustrates how even before the pandemic, we we're actually not training enough health professionals, even to keep up with population aging. So if we look at the percentage change in um, the number of uh, nurses per capita, doctors per capita, relative to the um, change in the share of the 80 plus population, we can see why quite clearly in this graph that uh, you know, we were not training enough doctors and nurses to keep up with um, population aging, let alone um, you know, unexpected shocks like COVID or could be other type of shocks. So the big question will be again, uh, you know, how do we address uh, the, the workforce uh, uh, crisis is linked very much to the financial issues we we'll discussed because um, a big part of those additional investment for more resistant health system needs to go clearly in training more and retaining more health professionals. Um, with that, I'll stop, um, you know, again with, uh, you know, that's the, the cover page for our Health at the Glance uh, publications, uh, thanking again Maya and her team and, uh, and the commission for the fantastic collaborations and looking forward very much to the panels and the discussion. Well, many thanks uh, Francesca for your presentation and for, for underlining the gravity of the situation because although there's a few positive, uh, such as the increase in um, online consults and the increase in flu vaccination, in general, I'd say indeed it underlines the importance of resilient healthcare systems. So in that respect, um, for the sake of today's event, we're going to focus on two um, parts of the report where indeed we would like to go a bit more in detail um, to get a better understanding also how stakeholders are involved in discussions to do with these items. So the first panel will focus on the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on the physical and mental health of young people where indeed you showed uh, very uh, important data to do with the impact the pandemic had on uh, young people's mental health. And the second panel um, that will be led uh, by Hans Martens will then focus on the importance of resilient healthcare systems and how to indeed overcome the challenges that healthcare systems face. So I'm very happy to introduce now the first panel. And again, Francesca, thanks so much for the data you provided because that will be instrumental for the discussion that we're going to have. And I'm very happy to have with us this morning two excellent speakers. We have Claudia Marinetti, the Di Director of Mental Health Europe. And we have with us Elena, Eleno, Eleonora, sorry for that, Varnutium, the President of the European Health Parliament. So Claudia and Eleonora, welcome this morning. It's great to have you with us. And as said, uh, this panel will focus on the impact of COVID-19 on the physical and mental health of younger people. And as Francesca said, um, the rate of depressive symptoms among young people from 18 to 29 more than doubled in several countries. And around half of young people from 18 to 29 in the EU reported unmet medical need for mental health care services. So very clear data where I think indeed um, the long-term challenges for mental health of young people are um, very grave. So that's something that we are keen to discuss during this panel. But first of all, because I have a few questions for you that I'm very keen to discuss with you. And again, I also would like to call on the audience again, because it's great to see the number of participants. So you're very welcome to come in. But before we go into the questions, I would like to ask the two of you, starting with Claudia, followed by Eleonora, can you please provide us with a short reaction um, to the report and to the data that Francesca just has shown. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, thanks for, for having us here. And, uh, and of course, also thanks for all the work that has been uh, gone uh, into this report. Uh, I think that uh, the report gives a great uh, overview of the pandemic impacts on youth mental health um, across Europe. Uh, it has highlighted the fact that the situation has been evolving over time and while there has been some increase in the uh, in the demand for support, the, the, as you just said, um, the needs of young people are not met. Um, half of the young people um, are reporting these unmet needs, uh, and that is more of double the, the share for uh, um, all adults. I think that what we need also to ask ourselves is, uh, uh, besides access to any kind of support, are the service available tailored 
to young people. And uh, I know that the report focused on 1829. Francesca mentioned that adolescents as well um, seem to, to have been impacted and younger children. Very often, let's remember that uh, um, adolescents are stuck between children's and adults' services. And this is something on which we still really need to, uh, to work on. Services and supports. I like to talk about supports um, because uh, it is not necessarily just about uh, uh, the, the, the traditional healthcare services. There are various types of supports, uh, uh, as I will mention later on, it can be um, peer workers, it's a primary care. I mean, we just need to, to change a little bit um, our vision as well. Um, the report makes a strong case for urgent and bold actions uh, to be made. There have been a range of measures across uh, Europe to support young people's uh, physical and mental health. Uh, more is needed, especially considering the potential long-term uh, impact uh, on uh, the younger generation. Um, Francesca was also mentioning in terms of the investments and financing, one of the things that we need to do is to make sure that we do not do more of what is not working and make sure that no member state uh, and therefore no person is left behind. So really moving together uh, and, and leveling up the gap. Um, there has been a scaling up of prevention and promotion measures uh, uh, and a report of uh, uh, accessibility challenges. Uh, um, rural and isolated areas uh, um, have uh, uh, more trouble already before in terms of access to services. Uh, when it, we talk about uh, uh, telehealth uh, also for mental health, uh, uh, there can be an increased uh, um, problematic there. Uh, and also in terms of finances, it would be interesting actually to have specific information of the out-of-pocket costs for young persons and their families when it comes to mental health support in Europe. Uh, speak to young people that have had the necessity to um, to, to enter mental health care, also for severe mental health problems. Uh, um, we do get a feedback that they said, it is because my family could support that. If I had not had the financial security to be able to access the support that I needed, then where I would be. So we, we really need to listen to this as well. I think what is needed, uh, uh, there has been also this highlight between links between income inequality and mental health um, in the report. Uh, we know that inequalities in mental health uh, and well-being uh, have persisted and in some cases have even widened uh, over the course of the pandemic. Uh, um, I think that well, we know that individuals experience different sets of barriers, so it is very, very important going ahead to focus at, on an intersectional um, approach. So what are the barriers, the different barriers that combine together affect individuals differently? Um, then uh, there was this uh, um, focus on prevention and addressing mental health uh, challenges uh, in the aftermath of the pandemic uh, uh, and frankly in the current context of multiple crises. Of course the report talks about COVID-19 but it is uh, very very applicable to uh, all the other problematics we're having, the war, the climate change, which are having really a, a big impact on, on people and on young people's uh, mental health. Um, and I think a further step should be made to also include a recovery approaches is more explicitly. There is the prevention promotion, but really also talk about uh, recovery for people. And also we need a better picture on uh, the availability access uh, to community-based uh, mental health services as opposed to clinical care uh, and uh, institutional care. Uh, it would be interesting to know where people are accessing support. Uh, for instance, is it in primary care? Is it in schools? Um, have a picture on coercion and human rights violations in mental health care, a data on the institutionalization. And I am saying this because it is known that the moment where you have coercive practices, that will then hinder further um, access to services because people will not want to access the services. Um, and is there data on the type of support uh, available and received? And qualitative data also on the appropriateness of support. Um, are, are young people, what I mentioned before, it is also, uh, are the needs what young people need? Is it offered, actually? It's not just a matter of simply accessing any kind of support. Um, and then also, yes, I think that the focus should be on mental health services that need to be age 
identity and culture appropriate? Do we, do we have this? Is there any info on this? And my last point is that uh, um, the COVID-19 has been detrimental on the mental health of uh, um, young people, but it would also be interesting to connect this with other issues impacting uh, young people's mental health, for instance, stress in education, social media digitalization, employment, cost of living, et cetera. And I'll stop here, thank you. Well, thanks so much uh, for that, Claudia, and especially also indeed pointing to the broader context where indeed we are in a state of perma crisis. And I think we also where Francesca clearly outlined that the current cost of living crisis and the financial impact on younger people has, has very grave consequences. So I think one question before I go to Eleonora, um, especially in light of the upcoming uh, mental health strategy, you, you mentioned a lot of the challenges that younger people face. What action must be taken to mitigate these challenges? Thanks. Yes, um, I think that one uh, of the things that, uh, of course, we need is a mental health system change. Uh, so, of course, we need the, the prevention of mental health problems, but also we need minimal, meaningful empowerment and active engagement of uh, uh, young people in decisions about their mental health um, and targeted mental health support at every stage of, um, uh, of life that also uh, um, integrates uh, extremely important resources such as peer workers and mental health educated primary care professional, as I mentioned before. Um, I think that uh, the, the point of co-creation is really important because if you do want to have policy changes as well that are actually effective, uh, you do need the people that are targeted to have a sense of, of ownership uh, uh, and to be able to tell you what they need, because that is really what uh, what is crucial here. We should not guess. We should listen to what uh, they have to say and really, truly involve them. So it's really co-creation and not just a tick of the box, ex box exercise, as sometimes, unfortunately, still happens. Um, many people with uh, pre-existing severe mental health uh, problems reporting a worsening of their problems uh, uh, during the pandemic. Uh, um, and uh, uh, besides the scaling up of prevention and promotion measures, uh, uh, it is also essential that really also with this new initiative, we focus on the whole spectrum from good mental health to psychosocial disability. This is also linked to changing the narrative about mental health. Often we talk about mental health and we, people immediately think about mental health problems. No, mental health is something positive. It's like health. We all have it, it's in a continuum and also it can go up and down through your life. And this work on the narrative and understanding of mental health is really crucial. Um, and it is also linked to the fact that uh, there's need to be a cre increased education and mental health support in formal and informal ed education. I think we can even be more ambition we need to improve the understanding of mental health through our communities, because it is also very much linked to the cohesiveness of our communities. Um, the new initiative, therefore, should take a psychosocial approach with a focus on intersectionality and the socioeconomic determinants of mental health, promote human rights based on coercive uh, and person centered mental health services, uh, have national action plans, ideally, on mental health. Um, and uh, uh, what we, we always push is also to have comprehensive objectives, uh, benchmarks, indicators, and an adequate budget. Uh, we keep asking for a European mental health strategy. I am not sure that uh, um, we are there yet with this initiative. It is a great, major, amazing step, uh, but what we would like uh, ideally to see is, uh, uh, is this. And my last point is that uh, we need more research, including disaggregated data, for the issue of uh, um, intersectionality um, and data should also provide consideration um, really for uh, uh, what is the picture of the kind of support that is available. Well, thanks for that, Claudia. I'm, I'm sure that in the second panel, when we indeed discuss the sustainability of healthcare systems and the need for more investment, we will come back to that element. But clearly what you said about the importance of a narrative and more education, I thought was very powerful uh, indeed when it comes to addressing mental health problems of younger people. So I will now go to Eleonora Varnutium. You're the president of the European Health Parliament. It's good to see you again with us. Um, we're very much looking forward before also going into more specific questions to you more general feedback on the report from your perspective. Yes. Thank you very much, Elizabeth, for the invitations, and I would agree with the great remarks from Claudia. Uh, we would like to welcome the report from OCD and the European Commission. I think it's very great to see that some of the main concerns that we raised as the voice of the youth were reflected into this report. 
and especially when it comes to behavioral health risk factors such as nutrition, physical, physical activity. Uh, it was great to see that uh, there were some steps taken from member states, for example, the European Child Guarantee, which was re uh, referred in the report. We would say that uh, this way we can tackle poverty and then children would have access to at least one healthy meal per day. Uh, so this was a great step uh, to do as well when it comes to physical activity, because due to the confinement measures, a lot of uh, people were staying at home. We saw an increase in the time they, sp they spent uh, in screens. So it's good to see that the, at high schools and at university, they are considering to have more increased uh, exercise. And this is something that uh, was not so highly mentioned in the past, but it's good to see that we are understanding right now that we need to take some preventive measures to have more healthier lifestyles. Uh, and it was, uh, as we were developing the, the policy recommendations, especially within the well-being of healthcare workers, it was quite important for us also to see that health is not only addressed from the physical aspect, but also on the mental health aspect. And moving into the future, I think as we are now seeing the burden that it has uh, had into the healthcare systems, I think it's very important to focus also uh, in improving the working uh, conditions of uh, healthcare workers. We saw that some countries have taken uh, advanced action in terms of improving the salaries for nurses, for example, but there, of course there's more uh, room to progress. Uh, thinking also of the mobility issues that we have in the great risk nation right now, many young people feel that their jobs are not fulfilling, they're having depression, they're having mental health issues. So it's very important to improve not only the working conditions, but also make the profession of, of healthcare especially more attractive, so we can keep young people uh, ambitious and driven as we should be in a healthy uh, society. Well, many thanks uh, for this introduction remarks, uh, Elena. It's true indeed that with European Health Parliament, you indeed focused a lot on the well-being um, of, of younger people as well. And, and I'm sure that also in that context and beyond, you have been looking at what concrete policy actions can we expect or do we want the EU to come up with? Yes. Uh, one of the greatest remarks that we have see already coming up was the creation of a thematic network on mental health. So it's good to see that stakeholders are coming right now together in EU member states to share best practices. This is one of the things that is moving forward and it's great to see that the European Commission is focusing on this. We were also discussing about the creation of mental health support offices and we can see that many countries have helplines so that uh, young people but also healthcare workers and the general, popul general population can have access in, in these tools. Digitalization is picking up, so it's also time to see how we can leverage on these tools that we have right now available. And also to what Claudia said, I, I agree as well, to have a permanent and maybe more stable financial instrument when it comes to mental health, because we would see some having some operation, uh, some grants when it comes to mental health, so it would be great to see some stability, let's say, in a long-term plan for mental health. This is not something that I would like to highlight happened just because of the COVID-19 pandemic. I believe that we are paying right now the price uh, austerity measures we took in 2018 with many budget cuts in healthcare and education. These are the, the main pillars of our societies. And I believe that we should have uh, strong financial instruments for the, for the young generation, but also for the future one when it comes in these two sectors. Well, absolutely. I think uh, that is very important uh, to note and also going forward indeed with the upcoming strategy uh, of the European Commission. So I see that we have one uh, question in the chats um, and I already implicitly addressed uh, this question, but indeed what expectations, um, ask an attendee, do you have from the announced council recommendation on mental health? Um, so I think both of you, I think you already mentioned it, but perhaps anything specific that you would like to, to mention. And let me also then say that other participants feel free to, to come in, because again, I think it's very important as we have so much expertise on board here with Claudia and, and uh, Eleonora that you come in. So well, um, they answer the question, please feel free to come in with other questions as well in the chat. So Claudia, I saw your hand. Uh, I think you wanted to come in. Yeah, just so besides the things that, uh, that uh, I've mentioned about this initiative, I think that uh, the initiative per se should be set in a way to the famous change in the narrative of mental health. Uh, um, there is now, for instance, uh, a call for uh, evidence that I really suggest everybody that there is interest interested to respond to that DigiSante has launched. Um, it is the, the way it is formulated is sometimes still uh, um, a bit disease oriented. Uh, while we are trying to move away from uh, a, a disease understanding of mental health, uh, because I think that one of the things that COVID-19 has shown to people 
is that situation can very much um, impact mental health. Uh, it is the lived experience that you have. It is your relationships. It is what the, the economic context, uh, the, the environment uh, in which you live, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so this, I think that besides what I've said before, it's really, I hope that this initiative is at least change the, the, the narrative um, surrounding mental health. And I don't want to, I mean, I don't want to criticize the call for evidence, huh? uh, absolutely, because those in the explanatory text, then you go there and you see the, the, the how, how the understanding of the psychosocials, the risk factors and everything. So that is good. But this is, is very much uh, uh, needed. Um, one thing this year is also the year of skills. Uh, and uh, let's also remember, it is not just about hard skills or technical skills. It is very much about those that, for some reason, are called soft skills, but let's say life skills, which includes taking care of your mental health and uh, and well-being. And hopefully, there will be links also in the initiative with this, and also with the European Mental Health Awareness Week, which will focus on, on these topics this year. Eleanor, Eleanor, is there anything from your side that you would like to add to this? Yes, I would like to, to focus more on the term that was on the report when it comes to income inequalities and mental health being linked together, so we know exactly what is, has to be improved. So for the educational programs for healthcare workers, I would like to see perhaps better more focus on mental health, so we can train those who support patients to take care of themselves of, of each other. So let's focus also on the training programs that we have for the future as the year of the skills, but also focus uh, more when it comes to to have this kind of measures from schools and from the early stages of life so we can uh, apply them. I think we, what we have done now, we were focusing more on into the recovery, but we need to learn what we have done and be more proactive in terms of being better prepared for the next pandemic or the next crisis that we can have. Absolutely. We also have a contribution from Professor Jan de Massenier, the chair of the Commission Expert Panel. And Jan, I think very rightly you say that um, COVID created additional stress on a vulnerable generation of youngsters. And you point to the fact that there is indeed uncertainty about the future, relations, climate change, economic perspective, uh, social media. I think that's a very important one as well. It creates a lot of um, stress for, for younger people. And um, you say, and, and I think rightly so, I think a lot of us can relate to the fact that indeed when we were in touch with younger people that were just having their studies um, from behind their laptop instead of, of having a more vibrant period that I think a lot of us can relate to as being important part of your education. So indeed no school, no informal meetings. Um, so I think your question is indeed um, COVID created a lot of additional stress. So it's perhaps more a statement than a question, but of course, um, before we go to the next question, um, anything, Claudia or Eleonora, that you would like to say when it comes indeed to this remark about the additional stress and the burden of COVID-19? Well, I think that this, if we analyze, because what we need to analyze is why, why has mental health worsened? And there are a lot of these social reasons. As I said, mental health is a lot about relationships. Those are really the supportive factors. Once we analyze those, we need to where to invest as well. Yes. And if I may add, I think that one of the biggest challenges we had as, as we talk with younger people is that the austerity measures we took in 2018, the COVID-19 pandemic, the climate change, the, the ongoing war in the Ukrainian, uh, uh, in Ukraine, it creates some kind of uncertainty to the young population. So this is exactly with the use of social media, being in isolation, seeing these perfect scenarios of what you should have achieved by the age of 30, 40 or whatever. This creates an extra pressure that we have, especially with, I would say, it's not highly mentioned, but also influencers and the kind of uh, uh, promotion of a lifestyle that you, you should have. This creates a, a, an extra pressure. And we see that also, especially with uh, families that have a first or second migration history, where we would see that parents have been uh, sacrificing so much for young people. I would say that today, young people are more educated than it was a couple of years ago. And once you enter the labor market, you see that the situation is not as you picture and imagine. This is why it's important to make the professions attractive again, not only healthcare, but in other sectors, because the reality is from the time you graduate and to the time you enter to, your, to the workforce and try to start a family, uh, what you see is completely different what, than it was a few years before or what you had, would expect to be happening. And as European citizens, I think we should definitely 
have uh, focus on, on our values and our qualities to have better lives for, for our generation. Absolutely. I think you need that. The quality of life cannot be, be underestimated, especially if you speak about patient-centered approaches. I think this is a very important one indeed. We have a question from Pavel Svoboda. Pavel, it's good to, to see that you're joining us, um, the CEO of eBrains. And you have a very good question about the role um, for research and innovation in the new um, European Mental Health Initiative. Because you say that much progress is indeed needed in arriving at new treatment options. Avenues such as precision psychiatry are promising, yet research budgets for mental disorders tend to be low in many member states. So, Claudia, Eleonora, anything um, from your side when it comes to indeed research and innovation in the European um, Mental Health Initiative? I think that we, for sure research is uh, is needed um, when it comes to treatment, uh, which which I find still a bit of uh, of. Uh, uh, passive, uh, uh, looking at the passive role of the person that needs to be treated. But okay, um, let's have a look at what has not worked so far. And then maybe let's think about uh, investing the resources on something else. Uh, we know that there have been uh, uh, a lot of, of things that have not worked well. And I guess that instead of insisting there, let's see what else is uh, uh, can be available there. I mean, if this is uh, if you're looking for uh, uh, innovation, I think it is uh, uh, very important to uh, look into um, medicines that can support people with mental health problems. I think definitely we shouldn't stop there. Uh, because maybe I, I don't know what is the the, the issue with um, with research, but I know that for sure the amount of resources that are put in uh, uh, in pharmacological um, treatment is way higher than what is put in many other types of support. So I think we do need to have a balance there. But for sure, research research is needed. It's definitely one of the things that uh, um, the initiative should uh, address. Thanks. Yes, I agree that research and innovation is important, but I think it's also important to have increased collaboration within EU member states in terms of sharing information. Right now, since we have the OECD report, we can see the information, then we can check to see which countries are doing better in certain areas. So I think this is also an, another piece of uh, information that is very much needed to be more open in terms of sharing this because mental health has been stigmatized and people are not very open to share this. Of course, member states also sometimes do not show, want to show this kind of weaknesses. So it's quite important that we start to share this kind of platforms and share this kind of information. And I think that uh, because I saw this comment about drug uh, use, especially in youth, uh, and we would say we see also obesity and overweight being in young, we, we move towards a more addiction kind of phase with overdoing when it comes to some the use of substances. So it's quite important to have this kind of uh, kind of balance and we support the young population because the, the reason why these people you move to addiction is because they're trying to eventually avoid the reality. So focus on the reality. What is the problem right there? Trying to improve that. Instead of criticizing why we have obese people, why we have drug consumption, focus on exactly what is the cause of the problem. And then we can uh, make some progress rather than just uh, saying this is the problem, that's the title, and this is what we have to deal with. Well, absolutely, Eleonora. And you, you hinted me to the fact that we have one last question before we go to the next uh, panel. Um, so perhaps, um, Claudia, you, you might want to come in as well, because it's true that the question is uh, about the increased use of alcohol or illicit substances uh, consumption during the COVID lockdown, especially by younger people. And of course, there, there is a risk for, for addiction um, and longer term and irreparable consequences on, on, on the brain. So anything from your side also on top of what Eleonora already mentioned? I think quite a, a few of the services and community-based services uh, that uh, uh, work on the mental health of young people do also work on addictions. Uh, you know, when people were in lockdown, what was missing to them was uh, ways to release and to, if you want, even work through their emotions. And that is the, the way out that they found. Um, there is this, and there is this is also why sometimes we, we link this also. It, it is not the same. Huh? Please don't take me wrong. but in terms of the over medicalization of mental health uh, which is it's a bit finding the, the the quick way out but in some cases people felt that they had no other solution i'm talking now about the addictions so it, the, the supports are there and i think that the the reflection is that uh, 
if you remove some things from people, people will need to turn to whatever is left to them. So let's not remove those things. Of course, there was a need for social distancing. I think that we need to start thinking about uh, alternative ways to make sure that uh, um, people can remain properly connected uh, um, in times of, of crisis, because this is clearly, clearly um, paramount to young people's well-being and also to their development into adulthood. Well, many thanks for that. And, and, and the two of you, really many thanks for your input um, during this panel. I think it, it's clear that uh, indeed um, the COVID-19 pandemic has had and still has a big impact on, on younger people. And going forward, especially in the EU's mental health strategy, but also indeed in increased investment, um, also in R&D, um, that will be very important. And also perhaps we are going to come back to that um, during the second panel. So many, many thanks um, to you, uh, Claudia and Eleonora. And Hans Martens, I'm very happy now to hand over to you for the second panel. Hans Martens is Senior Advisor at the European Policy Centre. Uh, you're an expert in the field, really, so I'm very happy to hand over for you and um, leads the discussion on, indeed, the resilience of healthcare systems and its importance going forward for Europe's recovery. Hans, the floor is yours, please. Thank you very much, Elisabeth. Uh, it's a pleasure to do this. And uh, I would also like to thank the OECD and the EU for the new version of Health at a Glance. I don't know how I could live without it. It's always a pleasure to see the new versions with a very rich collection of useful data on Europe's health system. And let me also mention, because I don't think we have that, you can actually download the publication for free if you don't have it already. Uh, just search on the internet, uh, either at the OECD or the EU side, and you will be able to download the whole thing. I think it's more difficult to get the book in, in a printed version, but that's another story. You can get the information. But a lot of the discussion uh, in the publication, but also in our societies, is uh, about the return to resilient and sustainable health systems. And that's going to be the focus of what we're going to discuss now. Of course, the consequence of COVID is uh, important in this uh, respect. The backlogs that we know about, the stress out and burnout personnel and many, many other things are in focus. But the fact is, as already pointed out by Francesca, that this is also happening at a time where we see the consequences of the demographic developments, you know, with a lot of over 80 uh, years old or elderly people in, in general, and maybe also with more comorbidities and fewer young people, not only to pay the taxes, but also to take the jobs. And when we talk about, we need to train more young people to become uh, health professionals and so on. We just have to remember that there is an, not an unlimited stock of people here to, to take from. Uh, there's also, uh, and I think stressed very much by uh, by Francesca, the uh, the additional stress on the public finances that backs up the health systems in Europe because of the inflation, because of the war, because of uh, we need to spend more on other things like defense and so on. So I think it's a difficult time at the moment to return to the resilient health systems. And yesterday we had a meeting uh, where a question came up uh, from somebody do we have in Europe an example of one European country that has managed the, to return to sustainable health systems? And I don't think so. I haven't seen an example. I've seen a lot of people now searching for ways to do that. And I think the beauty of the, of the publication that we have now and also uh, a discussion on a pan-European basis is perhaps that we can begin to identify some of the best practices going down that road and maybe avoid the usual uh, re uh, reinventing the wheel in every, uh, in every system. So it is very important, I think, to, to try to see what's going on in other European countries. But to help us uh, go into these or to answer these questions, we have two excellent speakers here. And uh, they are covering uh, a number of the, of the important areas. And I think together we can try to, to look at what uh, might be the answers to some of the questions. But the first one is Sarah Das, and she's representing the uh, European doctors. I think it's called the Standing Committee of the European Doctors. But you also know about the other uh, staff and personnel, in the, because we talk a lot about nurses as well. I know you don't represent them, but but they are your, your colleagues. So maybe we can focus here on the resilient uh, workforce issue. But we also have Simona Buscelli, who is Public Affairs Director and Eurodis, which is dealing primarily with uh, rare diseases in, uh, in Europe. And how are they being treated in this uh, uh, difficult situation we have in the health systems. But um, both of you has promised to give a short introduction to the subject and to your reactions to the Health at a Glance publication. So, Sarada, for you first. 
Good morning, and thank you very much for uh, giving CPME, the European Doctors, an opportunity to comment on this uh, report. Um, maybe just in general, a few observations that it's, again, a very interesting report to read, and uh, this emphasis on access to good health and healthcare is also ties very much into the CPME agenda. And I think it's also very interesting that the report highlights the social determinants of health, including the impact that financial difficulties can have on exacerbating health conditions. So there's just, in general, um, very interesting to follow the discussion. But of course, yes, we want to turn uh, to the situation of the medical workforce in particular. And indeed, we can really describe the situation currently as a state of crisis. And I think it was interesting also Francesca emphasized that even prior to the pandemic, um, there were uh, problems already well known. And indeed, also at CPME, we were discussing how to improve recruitment, how to ensure that working conditions are safe and lawful, and how to uh, safeguard patient access to healthcare, especially in areas that are underserved. Actually, in the early months of the pandemic, we surveyed our members um, and received varying, varying reports, obviously, on the, on the impact of the pandemic on their situation in terms of access to PPE, infection rates, and, and the, sadly also the death rates among doctors. But in the same surveys, our members emphasized very much that there were structural problems um, that they were dealing with, uh, and that even before the pandemic, they were obviously faced with excessive working hours and very uh, burdensome working conditions, which which uh, by far predate the health emergency. So uh, our observation of the last months is really that we see that the EU and the member states have made steps towards improving pandemic preparedness and management, but we see very little concerted action to improve these underlying structural fragilities in healthcare systems, especially in relation to the workforce. And maybe just two points to highlight is that um, our members are really reporting very worrying um, rates of uh, burnout and uh, violence against doctors um, to the extent that during the vaccination rollout, several of our members had to have police protection. And uh, this is re exacerbating the whole situation um, tremendously. Also, we now and also in the report, there is there is a lot of discussion of the backlog of treatments and uh, taking this backlog in uh, conjunction with currently there are extremely high demands for health care. Um, we can see that there are really going to be years and years of of um, patients uh, having unmet medical needs because the resources are not there to give them timely access to care. So maybe just to um, draw some key conclusions over the pandemic experience now with the data provided by OECD, uh, we really see that the health workforce is um, very essential to all of the other healthcare systems uh, uh, objectives being met. So the health workforce, uh, workforce is really the, the lifeblood of these healthcare systems. And um, we saw during the pandemic that it was to some extent possible to upscale capacities such as uh, buying equipment or buying beds, but uh, we could not easily solve the shortage of healthcare professionals. And uh, what at CPME we really see is that we risk uh, the the, the, we, there's the danger that medicine is losing its attractiveness as a lifelong professional calling and uh, that it will be increasingly difficult for uh, recruitment, but also retention of doctors uh, to support uh, patient care. And we saw that really objectively, some member states had under-resourced their healthcare systems, uh, not just to deal with a pandemic, but even to provide universal health coverage, which is an obligation on all member states. So our conclusions was that member states have to shift their thinking from this just in time to a more just in case thinking of resourcing healthcare systems. And one of the ways that we believe this can be achieved is if the commission can adopt recommendations for minimum capacity benchmarks, which member states could then um, try to achieve, which we, we can expand on later. But um, really, one conclusion that we also have is that none of this is new when we talk to the healthcare sector. Everyone, all health policymakers agree on these facts. So what we really need is high level political commitment and awareness for these problems to be able to achieve um, these policy changes. So maybe I leave it at there for the moment. Yeah. 
But thank you for that. So there was a lot of, of good content, but also some scary stories about uh, the threats to doctors and so on. And actually, you raised the question first, or you pointed to European solutions, which is something we would like to look for in this context. But the other thing is that, uh, as, as you were saying, the problems were there even before the pandemic. And in some cases, we were not really well prepared for it. And I think that's a part of creating resilient health system. But the question is, are we just wanting to return to the systems that we had before the COVID or do we want to have something better? But if I may just raise uh, one question also, because if you if you take the publication and look into for, to countries, for example, where there's most doctors per thousand inhabitants, you will often see that they coincide with areas where there's a lot of unmet, unmet needs for health. So it's not always just uh, because there's a positive co correlation between the number of doctors and the outcome, if you like, and maybe the outcome for the patients as well. So is there also a question it's a leading question, but but <laughs> could there be something about reorganizing the way that doctors work and the health personnel uh, works as well? And are you flexible enough to uh, to participate in such a process? I think uh, one one sort of outcome that we see is that we really need much more intentional workforce planning. And of course, workforce planning is supported by data. So we need good data and good comparable data. And here also we see that the EU is making efforts to improve this data collection, but also comparability. Um, and then we need uh, this data to be used. And I think there, there is often a bottleneck, even in systems where there's relatively good data available. Health workforce planning sometimes is not prioritized as a political objective and therefore uh, the, the the conclusions that the data delivers goes unused um, and there are we need to move beyond just headcount as you say we need to look at geographical imbalances we need to look at uh, specialties um, obviously in, in general practice some of these problems are much more acute even than in, in other specialties um, so there is much more to go with but also I I think this was also at an event even before the pandemic, I heard this uh, chasing good data should not prevent us from taking action now. Oh, no. The trends are very clear, the problems are very clear, and uh, we always want to have evidence-based policies, but also we shouldn't delay important measures to be taken now in the attempt to improve data even further. Yeah, uh, so uh, I think there was, um, there's an issue there about um, because we have a limit uh, resources to take from to uh, to focus on the on the better things, including I think you were mentioning without really saying it the prevention part as well, so preventing people from being sick and so on. But let's uh, turn to Simona uh, now. Um, you, um, I don't know if, if you have a general observation or if you want to to focus particularly on uh, on the rare diseases. But uh, let's hear what you have to say, Simona. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Hans. Um, it's, uh, I think uh, the, the general observation is that this uh, level of expertise um, provided by the OECD on the health of the glasses is instrumental for good and evidence-based policy making. Um, I would like to uh, focus on a, a couple of things that have had a direct impact and uh, in, the, in the area of rare diseases have been magnified in terms of consequences of uh, of COVID-19, but also extract some uh, general consideration from the rare disease experience that could be applied uh, to uh, overall health system. In particular, uh, for, for people living with rare diseases, the disruption of hospital and specialist care uh, that has, has been um, identified also by Francesca has been one of the most affected areas by COVID-19 for people with rare diseases would need specialist care and often very scarce, uh, which is very often very scarce in the national context, has been um, uh, particularly important. We did a survey at the, at, during the very first lockdown, so it now feels ages ago, but in fact, effectively it was only three years ago, uh, out of 7,000 people representing over 1,200 uh, 1, diseases, it results that uh, almost 85% of all of them had their uh, ha ha specialist care disrupted. Hmm. One of the silver lining that that uh, that that came out of that is that the use of the consistent use of telemedicine or e-medicine, particularly teleconsultation, have helped fill in the gap. And this needs to be uh, uh, continued, particularly in a situation where rare diseases were uh, actual networked um, uh, knowledge, so basically being able to access not only patient to doctor, 
uh, knowledge, but also doctor, uh, doctor to doctor knowledge across countries can help improving the experience with care, particularly in another air, another survey that we did on hospital care, um, uh, done over uh, a number of patients uh, over five of the European referen re reference network, yeah. we noted that care experience by patients was uh, markedly better in those centers of expertise belonging to the European reference network. And here there is one first uh, general consideration that networked um, health system uh, across Europe can provide higher quality um, experience for uh, uh, patients, not only with rare diseases. And I would also like to appreciate and show appreciation for the OECD to, for including uh, patient re reported uh, uh, experiences in uh, their in their report as a way to uh, anchor uh, the design of health system on the patient needs, which is particularly important uh, in uh, rare diseases. Um, one of the other areas that I would like to extract from the importance of uh, of the impact of COVID nineteen, for example, on uh, rare diseases to uh, the general. Um, uh, health system is the use of uh, uh, the European Reference Network clinical management uh, platform, which was translated to one, the clinical management support system for COVID-19 in order to connect different experts from different countries to see what the best management was possible, but also um, used into supporting Ukraine uh, at the time of need. So in particular, in those two areas, I think there is a lot to you know, to consider what is the data, uh, but also a lot to a lot of good that could come. Along. One last point that I would like to focus on is on what was lying on one of the last slides from Francesca in terms of the challenges in financing the health systems. Um, it is clear that a higher tax burden is not a preferred, pr probably wouldn't be a preferred option by anyone. So I would like to focus on efficiency particularly when it comes to um, avoiding wasteful spending. And I'll give you a practical example. Um, on average, a person living with a, a rare disease might take up to five years to have a correct diagnosis. And uh, when it comes to a correct diagnosis, what it means, it means a number of incorrect diagnoses, a number of, uh, um, um, a number of uh, uh, exams uh, such as um, diagnostic exams and imaging exams that might not be necessary and might take a long, uh, a great toll on the person, also on the mental health of the person, but also on the expenditure in the health system. If we were to be able to have an outcome based goal, such as uh, getting a right diagnosis in rare disease within one year of coming into contact with a healthcare system, we could reduce and be much uh, expenditure and be much more efficient. And that can only be done through collaboration at regional, national, and international level. Thank you very much, Simone. I think um, what you're basically telling us, learning from your sector with the rare diseases that European solutions work well. Uh, you mentioned efficiency. Uh, it always makes it a little bit uh, nervous when people uh, say that because there needs to be a quality aspect and you were quick to to put that in as well because we need to do that for patient-centered and probably more talk about value creation, but also from the, uh, the diagnostics. And that leads to another question because uh, to, Precise diagnosis that you're talking about will, of course, save a lot of mistreatments and therefore a lot of, of, uh, of loss of, of efficiency in the health system. Um, but um, that will also require the use of artificial intelligence. So we have a question here coming up, uh, which, about, which is really about the European health data space. And that's one of the European solutions that we could use uh, that could maybe help the doctors, but it could certainly also help the patients, as Simona was talking about. So, what what are your expectations to the? Why are your expectations to the European health data space? Will it help us? We think that there is enormous potential in the European health data space, but it must be done right. And we also see that the implementation. Uh, 
different countries are starting from very different parts of departure and we need to really make sure that the implementation is uh, done well and that especially the burden is not on health professionals from our side we've already invested a lot in uh, promoting um, digital skills digital competences among professionals mm, yeah. but there will be more uh, cost in terms of infrastructure and training also coming up uh, in the implementation of the European health data space. And this cannot be passed down to the professionals themselves. There must be support in, in the implementation here. And um, always uh, when it comes to data, we have very strong emphasis on consent. So we must have yeah. very clear, um, clear uh guidelines and also clear implementation again on how this patient data is handled how it's saved who has access to it um also clear clarity on liabilities and this applies uh for the primary use of data but also to secondary use of data and uh, one main thing where we think there should be a once only principle so doctors should really emphasis have an emphasis on providing um data for primary use which is linked to uh, patient care but uh, we should not take more resources even from um, doctors' time to provide these for a secondary care. I've heard that story before. You know, we have new technology and then uh, doctors and nurses are spending time in front of a screen instead of with the patient. So, so patients and, uh, and health professionals must be involved, I suppose, in developing the new technologies because they are there to set resources free rather than the opposite. But I think, Simone, in your case, uh, where we have relatively few cases per country, but a lot on a European basis, you must have big expectations about, you know, getting the data across the borders in Europe and in one European health data system. Yes, there is a, a there is great expectation as uh, as always in a, in, a, in an area where, um, uh, in our area where knowledge is scarce. Um, and particularly knowledge around <laughs> everything, uh, really, on terms of knowledge about the diseases and where there is treatment or in interventions, how well uh, uh, are these interventions faring? Um, and also, particularly when uh, the expertise might be concentrated in few areas across Europe, how do we ensure that both uh, the knowledge and the patient, if necessary, travel um, to uh, acquire this uh, expertise. And in particular, if you look at the very long tail of the over 7,000, uh, six to 7,000 diseases, uh, mm -hmm. those are uh, diseases that affect up to 500 patients in Europe. And you can see that here, the added value of the European Union is not only um, welcome, is entirely necessary. And if, if there is, uh, uh, if we are talking again about quality, um, we need to have to concentrate the expertise in, in uh, centers that of, of excellence that are interconnected in order to enable the workforce to understand what uh, is um, uh, the best care available for that particular disease and to share that knowledge. But also, in term, when, it, when, we, when we talk about intervention, be them therapeutical or others that are performed uh, with a certain number of uh, in a certain number of cases, which in individual countries in non is not necessarily uh, possible. When it comes to the EHDS uh, specifically, we 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 welcome it, but we welcome we also are aware of the fact that it needs to be done appropriately with the right um, uh, with the right uh, framework mm -hmm. for uh, the for the use of the data, both in the primary and uh, secondary use, and for particularly in rare diseases, what where the uh, rarity is uh, the norm rather than the exception, um, making sure that the uh, appropriate privacy setting are uh, included because in some cases, not even serial anonymiz anonymiz anonymization of secondary data could work. However, um, data is um, of real importance to us in at all that level of the management of the diseases. Thank you. Uh, the time is uh, beginning to uh, run out, but uh, I have a little uh, difficult task for you, Sarala, because I have two questions here that I want you to, uh, difficult ones to respond to in two minutes. The one is, is from uh, Gaetan Lafortune from OECD, who wants to expand a little bit more on the idea of setting minimum health workforce, as you were talking about. And the other one is a rather long commentary from Jan de Masener, uh, uh, who has, who says 
which I think we all know that there is a lot of focus now on the primary health care, you know, to to move from sick care to health care, actually, and and work and spend a lot more than the 14 or so percent that we spend on primary health care today in Europe, uh, move into this and maybe also move into integrated community care, have more precise diagnosis and so on. So move into the early phases of, uh, of the profession rather than, you know, curing people at the big hospitals. But he also mentions examples of places where there's a lot of, of of doctors, for example, Romania, but a lot of them are going into big hospitals in uh, in um, Western cities, you know, in Western European cities. Um, is it? Can I ask you directly? Is it? Will doctors rather cure than prevent? And and have your difficulties? Can you help us move into into this early prevention stage, or is it just not a good career? I think that we really emphasize everywhere we can the need for prevention, even now in the most recent legislation that has been adopted in European Health Union legislation was one of our primary priorities that prevention should explicitly be included in, in this legislation as an objective. Again, in the European health data space, we've just adopted our amendments uh, yesterday and we again included uh, prevention should be one of the objectives also that is uh, pursued by, uh, by the use of the health data. So um, this is something really we, we cannot support enough. We're involved in many initiatives, uh, especially around vaccinations, for example, where it's really about preventing ill health. Um, so there I can say that uh, that uh, that remains one of our primary objectives. Um, maybe to look at the, the question on primary care, indeed, uh, as mentioned already, we know that in general practice there have been um, shortages, there have been many reforms, and uh, there is really uh, specific questions in this sector um, that need to be uh, tackled. And uh, there also uh, we see in terms of recruitment retention that there uh, need to be special measures taken to ensure that um, in, in primary care and general practice that there are um, continued, uh, that this, these positions remain attractive and that there is continued interest and continued service uh, and continued Continuity of service in these areas. Um, on the question on the minimum benchmarks, indeed, we've already had interesting discussions with Gaetan on this. And uh, what we really see is that the data is there. So uh, I think uh, from our perspective, we were looking more at uh, member states looking at system level um, uh, minimum capacities. But obviously, as already mentioned, uh, there is more behind that primary kind of target. There must uh, be a definite attention to geographic. Uh, balance to uh, balance in different specialties and um, we need to to make sure that this is also of course adjusted to national specificities but we we do think it is time to move from just objectively looking at what is happening at EU level to saying okay below this level of resources and it does not only affect workforce we believe you can no longer provide safe uh, universal care and much less deal with emergencies which will inevitably occur in future yeah so this is not something the eu should fix but something that people should agree or the countries should agree on on a EU, eu european basis based on best practices i suppose right Yes, well, we have the division of competences that we have, but we think yeah. that there can be much more done in terms of guidance and uh, yeah. And and uh, from EU level, and this is one point maybe also that, that's come up, there are incredible investments currently being made into health systems. Yeah. And we need to make sure that these investments are made uh, in a way that really fix the problems that are at national level. And we believe on one hand, this can be achieved by having this EU level guidance and benchmarks. And on the other hand, we need to involve stakeholders from the system, including medical professionals, to identify where these investments are best put and uh, not just make easy choices of where to spend this money. I have a million other questions I'd like to uh, to ask you, uh, including, for example, uh, the question of health literacy, because if you look at health at a glance now, there's a number of examples of uh, what that means for participation in the in the preventative side as well. So maybe that's also a part of uh, of uh, returning to resilient health system. There's also the question of the mix of public and private investments in health and so on. But I'm afraid that the time has run out. So uh, I'd just like to extend a big thanks, I think, for all of us to Sarala and to Simona for your contributions. Uh, we have to move to the conclusions now. So I hope that Maya Matthews is on board and we'll turn on the mic and the uh, and also the uh, camera. No, you are there, Maya. Okay, good to see you. And thank you very much.
we will turn on to the concluding remarks now, and they will come from Maya Matthews, who is the head of unit for performance of health systems in the uh, TD Santé in the European Commission, but also, if I can put it this way, the very strong driving force behind health at a glance from the EU side. So thanks a lot for giving us this gift, as you know it is for some of us, and uh, try to maybe make, make a few conclusions uh, at the end of this uh, interesting discussion. Maya, the floor is yours. Thank you, Hans. I can hear an echo. Is it possible to stop? No? Can you hear an echo when I speak? Okay. Perfect. So I would like to thank uh, the, firstly the European Policy Center for, for taking on this um, um, and, and organizing this uh, seminar. We're always very happy to speak about the health at a glance. And uh, it's really a rich discussion today. I really enjoyed uh, listening to the speakers. Um, and of course, I can't, uh, I can't start any presentation without thanking the OECD and Francesca and her team, because I think this is a long established relationship we have with, um, with the OECD. And I think with every edition, we're able to fine tune it a bit more. It wasn't a coincidence that the, this uh, 2022 Health at a Glance focused very much on the impact of the pandemic. And uh, we chose uh, on purpose uh, children and youth because obviously this is our future generations and we need to make sure that uh, what happened during the pandemic, that we can mitigate that. And so I must say that I was very shocked and troubled by this chapter and the outcomes um, that we've seen. But again, with data, Hopefully, we can now uh, make some uh, make make some make, make some moves and address um, these very um, disturbing uh, figures, especially in, in mental health, but also on, on lack of physical activity. The second chapter, as well, uh, the impact of COVID on non-COVID care, has shown us what we kind of knew from an ad hoc, ad hoc basis and speaking to a lots of um, stakeholders, but to actually see the clear facts and figures about um, the huge plummeting and screening. Um, of course, the the what what the, the impact that of COVID has had on the workforce. I think it's very important that we actually this is a, this is a wake up call to all of us. And by having this evidence based um, statistics and data visualization, I really hope that uh, member states and all stakeholders will look at this very seriously and see that we have a window of opportunity here to really try to try to make some amends and also look forward. Um, the, the, the presentations um, um, by, by Francesca was excellent. For me to try to sum up uh, in a nutshell what the health of the glance shows us, I would say is the word inequalities. Um, we know that uh, life expectancy uh, plummeted um, in all member states apart from two between 2019 and 2020. Um, perhaps what you don't know is that uh, between 2020 and 2021, uh, some member states bounced back quite quickly and even gained some life expectancy. Others actually went lower, went further. So now what is the picture in Europe? The picture in Europe now is that we actually have a very fragmented picture and the inequalities have increased. And here I'm just talking between countries. What we've also heard from, from the speakers today is that um, the, the socioeconomic uh, impact has been huge, that people in financially precarious positions have suffered more. So I can imagine that even within countries, we're seeing um, big, big differences. Um, so what can we do about this? Um, I think, first of all, there are many uh, actions, and, and Sarada uh, mentioned that um, within the EU, we have lots of instruments now available to, to member state, but also to stakeholders to, to help with, with health and health systems. Um, I've mentioned the Recovery and Resilience Facility. This is providing a lot of um, uh, funds for member states. And we are happy that in many cases, uh, member states are focusing on um, digital health, for example, on workforce to a certain extent. But I agree with the speakers that there's by no means enough uh, money going into health systems. Uh, we also heard a very good comment about the fact that um, we need to also be smart with our investments in health systems. And here I want to thank Jan de Meissner for, for making this comment, because I was going to say this, but Jan has said it already. We need to really find ways to incentivize uh, investment in primary care. 
We need to look very closely at integrated care. We can't just focus on health systems um, and then uh, not look at the consequence in social care. For example, the health workforce. Um, as you know, this is, a, this is a topic very close to my heart. And I think it's very important to say publicly that there is a major, major urgency, especially with nurses. Uh, we need to really look at how we are treating nurses, how uh, we, uh, we, we can actually try and find a way to address this huge challenge that's before us. Um, Sarada said very well that these structural um, issues were already there, but to hear that the COVID pandemic has compounded them, that we're having burnouts of all health staff. And I would also like to add, it's not just clinical, it's also non-clinical staff. The pressure on people in the health systems is absolutely um, terrifying. Um, so what can we do? Um, and here I think, um, I, can, I can tell you all the things that we're doing in the EU, under the EU for Health program, we have just started and launched a joint action with 18 member states led by Italy to look at better planning and forecasting for um, health workforce. We also have, and I'm very pleased about this, uh, a multi-stakeholder um, partnership that's been creating, look, looking specifically at uh, skills of the health workforce of the future. So these are all wonderful opportunities for people to get together and to work closely. But I think that we do need a fundamental paradigm shift in the way we address health systems. We need to turn things on there, turn things upside down and see how we can invest more in prevention. Uh, the dial on prevention um, expenditure has been stuck on 3%. Um, I, I joke with my staff saying that if it moves higher, if we get to double digits, which I think it should be, I will buy champagne for everyone. But uh, joking aside, we really need to find a way to convince the politicians, because in the end, they're the ones who have got the money uh, to, to invest in prevention and primary care. Um, I think that um, another area I wanted to say, I don't want to be too much uh, doom and gloom, is uh, the silver lining of uh, digital health. Um, the fact that we now um, have lots of opportunities to work with uh, digital health. And I'm very glad for the, for the question on the European health data space. Again, in the, in the EU health domain, I always say that we are very, very innovative. And so here I want to also mention that the European health data space is the first of its kind. We are creating something very, very special um, at, at a regional level. So within the EU, we are hoping to create um, a, a space where patients themselves can have access to their own medical records and also be able to transport them, whilst at the same time providing uh, data uh, to, to researchers, to stakeholders, to policymakers, which is in, interoperable to really be able to capitalize on all the data that's out there. And this will be the first data space. So there are different data spaces. There's a European Data um, Act where we hope that this will be a kind of sectoral uh, rolling out. But as usual, with the health, we are the first, we are, we are the front runners in this. Um, in the same line on data, we've seen during the pandemic how key it is to have data. And we've seen as well, um, I think uh, um, it was explained really uh, very eloquently, how teleconsultations and the use of, of digital tools uh, for health delivery was, was, was really key. Uh, here again, a voice of caution. Uh, we are seeing some sliding back from member states, um, so we need to get that right. We need to make sure that where digital health and teleconsultation works well for specific patient groups, that's um, supported and strengthened. We need to evaluate these, and we also need to make sure that it doesn't um, that, that teleconsultations uh, aren't, don't become you know the standard. We need to really make sure that um, the high quality health healthcare. That, uh, that we want and that we expect uh, in Europe um, continues. So I think um, in conclusion, I have, I have three minutes left. And uh, here I would just like to say that um, I think it's really important that there's so much interest in health. We've, we've had this opportunity over the last two years where health has been at the top of the political agenda. Obviously now it's slipping down. So my plea to you all is to keep up the momentum, keep on, um, keep on uh, talking about health, keep on acting on health. Um, you know that we are building a European health union I think you've seen that we've got many building blocks in, in place now. It's a very exciting time to be in health. And if any of you can do anything to convince young people to go into the health sector, I would be most grateful. 
Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Maya. It was great. Uh, but please continue doing what you can to spread the gospel about cooperation, finding common solutions. You mentioned a couple of examples, but I think this is the way forward because we can't keep reinventing the wheel, as uh, I've said before. So uh, if we can help uh, in any way, uh, let us know to spread the gospel and of, of cooperation at the European level. I think it will be all more formalized within the frameworks that you talked about, the European Health Union and so on and so forth. And we also, by the way, if I may mention this, have a DD reform, which is also trying to help to, uh, uh, to, to increase cooperation on good solutions between countries and so on and so forth. So thanks a million, Maya. And I just turn back to Elizabeth uh, to see if you have any final comments and things from the EPC worth mentioning. So over to you, Elizabeth. Well, thanks so much. And also thanks so much to you, Maya, for your words, for your call to action to indeed ensure that health remains high on the political agenda. I think I couldn't agree more with the importance of that and also thanks so much uh, to you and your team at Santé for the excellent collaboration because more than ever it is important and, and therefore big thanks to the OCD to Francesca and your team to have uh, evidence-based policy making I think especially in a year where there will hopefully be a lot of attention on health leading to the 2004 uh, European elections we need evidence and data so in that respect I was very very happy to host all of you this morning Again, many thanks to DG Santé, to the OECD, but also to our excellent speakers, um, Claudia, Eleonora, Sara, and Simona. Many, many thanks also to you, Hans, for hosting an excellent panel. At the European Policy Center, we keep working on the European Health Union because it is said that it is a reality, but it will not be a reality before indeed inequalities have been tackled, socioeconomic consequences and more investment in health is a reality. So we keep working on it. And I really would like to call on you in case you're not yet registered and receive our newsletters, do so on our website, because indeed uh, remaining in touch as a healthcare community to ensure that health remains on the agenda is more important than ever. So we hope to see you next time as well at the European Policy Center. So with that, many thanks again and have a good rest of the day. Thank you.